Okay, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks, Aaron, for inviting me to come uh, speak with you all. I think I may have presented a couple of years ago, but some time has passed and we've done a little bit more work on planting green in the state of Pennsylvania. So I just have basically more data to add to what Aaron and, and David have shared about planting green. And we've drawn a lot of the same conclusions um, from our work across Pennsylvania. Um, and the main thing I wanted to show with, with these couple of slides is we are working with uh, orders of magnitude different levels of biomass compared to, I think, what was shown. Um, this is from a site in southeastern Pennsylvania where our cereal rye got to be close to five tons per acre. So, um, of course, not all of our research includes this heavy residue, but this is what we can be working with in some instances. So um, we're all aware of the soil conservation and water quality uh, benefits of planting green. Uh, we've seen huge benefits in terms of soil moisture management, um, but weed suppression and weed management is where we really see uh, the benefit being kind of an immediate return on investment. So there's plenty of growers who are adopting planting green for uh, soil health, soil conservation practices, but building your organic matter, uh, water holding capacity, these types of things takes a long time. But for weed suppression, this is something that folks can see almost instantly within um, you know, half a year of planting their cover crop. So I just wanted to share some work from Dr. John Wallace, who's our weed specialist at uh, Penn State. He uh, did some work comparing planting uh, soybeans green into uh, cereal rye planted at uh, 120 pounds per acre uh, compared with planting into pre-plant killed cereal rye or early killed cereal rye. And um, what we can see, let me get my laser pointer. So here we have weed density significantly higher in the early killed uh, plots compared to the very low weed density uh, in planting green plots. So we're reducing the number of weeds that we can count at the time of post herbicide application when we plant green compared to when we kill that cover crop early. And one of the most exciting things that his lab has found, and they've found this for a number of different weed uh, species, but this was specifically counting smooth pigweed um, at post-emergence timing. And they uh, counted the number of weeds and measured the height of, of the smooth pigweed. And in the early killed plots, there's a much, not only is there more weeds uh, per plot, but there's a much broader range of heights, meaning, uh, so here's a pigweed taller than 15 inches that is well outside of the um, on label range. We want to be, we want these weeds to be smaller than about the size of a Coke can if we're spraying them specifically if they're uh, herbicide tolerant. And so compare that to the planting green plots where we have fewer weeds and we have smaller weeds, smaller than about five inches tall at the time of post application. So um, we're finding that planting green with the cooling of the soil is delaying um, the speed of emergence and meaning that the window for on-label herbicide applications uh, is extended, which is, which is great because um, it, it can be tough to cover all the acres you need to in a timely manner. So um, really quickly want to summarize what I'm going to, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to tell you here. The top tips for planting green that we've learned uh, from my graduate research several years ago uh, across the state of Pennsylvania and then some additional research we've done is first, if it's dry in the spring, uh, it's important to kill early because planting green does draw up excess soil moisture. Uh, and if there's not excess moisture, it can rob that water from your cash crop. So the great part about planting green is it's an adaptive management practice and it can, you can pull the plug at any time there's no rain in the forecast, well, you just can terminate the cover crop. We strongly recommend trying to practice in soybeans before doing it in corn. Soybeans have proven to be uh, highly adaptable to the practice for a number of reasons, and corn is more finicky um, 
in terms of population and nitrogen management. So try it in soybeans first uh, before, before you tackle it with corn. We recommend, as um, was just mentioned in the presentation before me, reduce those winter cereal cover crop seeding rates. Um, and I'll talk specifically about the studies we did for that. And also, if you're in a high fertility situation, you can reduce rates even further or just be careful about the amount of manure or, or fertilizer you're putting on if you're planting green. We recommend rolling the cover crop um, if it's over about a foot tall or you know, as, as frequently as can as you can, rolling is a better practice than letting the cover crop stand. And uh, using row cleaners or residue managers to open up that furrow, um, depending on your goals, is, is a good practice. We, we preferred using a planter instead of a drill for soybeans. Um, that will vary farmer to farmer, but we found better success with um, a, a planter instead of a drill. It's important to understand your carbon and nitrogen ratio impact of your cover crop on your next crop. We always recommend scouting and using integrated pest management. So if, if you're getting into planting green for the first time, you could encounter different pests or different timings of, of, of pests um, from your normal practice. And we just always would recommend scouting frequently and using integrated pest management. And then our last tip for success with planting green is to find a mentor if you, nearby geographically, hopefully you can find someone with similar soil types and, and similar rainfall that has made it work. And it really is best to learn from someone, um, someone else's mistakes so you don't have to make any, those mistakes. So in a nutshell, that's what I'm gonna talk about and just present a little bit of data to back these uh, comments up. So really briefly, my uh, graduate work uh, took place at five different locations across the state of Pennsylvania, two research farms and three farmer cooperator sites, two sites in the Southeast and three in the center part of the state. We, um, there was a wide range of of days between our pre-plant kill, a herbicide burn down and planting green. So our goal was about two weeks, but in reality, with on-farm research, you understand that that ended up ranging from five days to about 30 days. Um, but our, our results uh, ended up um, being similar in a lot of, a lot of instances. Um, we did not use any neonicotinoid seed treatments in order to protect slug predators. So at least in Pennsylvania, one of the reasons why farmers were telling us they were planting green was because they found that it helped reduce their slug damage to their cash crops. Um, and we hypothesized that that was because it was providing uh, alternative food for the slugs. So there's something besides little corn or soybean plant there to eat, as well as providing habitat for beneficial predators that can help provide top-down suppression of the slugs. So in order to protect those uh, good critters, specifically uh, ground beetles, we did not use neonixie treatments. And we also did not use fungicide seed treatments um, on corn or soybeans. And uh, you know, from what we learned, I would say maybe maybe that wasn't the best idea, and maybe those uh, should be recommended just because of the impacts on the soil uh, environment. And then uh, all the management besides pre-plant kill and planting green was all left up to our farmer cooperators. So it really reflected what they were doing across uh, the rest of their farms. And so uh, that first tip, kill early in a dry spring. Um, I think this has been presented previously or has, has borne out in a number of studies. So this figure shows um, a date of planting uh, all the way through um, first week of August. And then our dashed line is our pre-plant killed soil moisture and our solid line is where we planted green soil moisture. At the date of planting, we had drier soil in the planting green, but a couple weeks later that had switched and we had more moist soil in the planting green treatment. Um, this is a representative site that's shown, but even when we averaged the data across sites, this trend was still uh, significant. So um, we're getting drying of the soil 
uh, from those trans plants transpiring, continuing to grow, and then we have the conservation of the soil moisture with that nice thick uh, cover crop residue. Uh, so try soybeans before trying corn. Um, if you've ever gone to like a, a seed um, seed sales meeting, winter meeting or anything, you've probably seen these um, yield stability curves. So basically, um, if, if the yield is uh, equal across all environments between the two treatments, uh, the slope would equal one. But if it's favored in one environment, that slope would increase and vice versa. So we found that planting green did not impact soybean yield uh, across 15 different site years. It didn't matter if we had reduced soybean stands. We had reduced soybean stands down to uh, 50,000 plants per acre in one instance. And we have in the planting green treatment, we saw no reduction of yield. So soy soybeans are incredibly resilient to this practice. Um, but uh, when we planted corn, we did uh, green, we did see a yield penalty in the higher yielding environment. So these green dots are uh, where we planted green, and this is yield across the different sites and then the treatment yield. So you can see the slope of the planting green treatment is less than one. That means in these higher yielding environments, we saw a penalty to planting green and a, and a benefit to killing that cover crop early. However, in the lower yielding environments, that relationship uh, switched. But this, as you can see, this year is a bit of an outlier. So really, um, because our nitrogen was managed the same is, is one reason why we expect we, we had yield reduction in, in corn across these sites. Um, and another thing is residue interference and reduction in corn population. So that corn plant has one ear and your yield is very, very tightly tied to your population. Whereas with soybeans, if there's reduced population, it can add branches and flowers and compensate for yield. So um, for that reason, corn is just trickier to manage with planting green and, and there's higher risk of yield reduction if your nitrogen management and your um, you know, planter setup isn't dialed in perfectly. So again, try it with soybeans before you try it with corn. So um, within that large study across um, 15 site years, we also wanted to look at specifically what the uh, seeding rate and nitrogen fertilization rate impacts on uh, cereal rye would be to, to dial in um, the best practices for planting green. So this was just replicated at research farms, um, not at any farmer cooperator sites, but we had three different seeding rates, uh, 30, 60, and uh, 120 pounds of cereal rye per acre. And then um, we looked at pre-plant kill or planted green. And then we also looked at, in each of those plots, 30 pounds per acre of nitrogen or 60 pounds per acre of nitrogen. We understand that farmers aren't usually um, putting inorganic nitrogen fertilizer on a, a cereal rye cover crop, um, but this was used as like a proxy for a, a higher nitrogen situation or a lower nitrogen situation, higher history man of manure versus lower. Um, so we could more closely control it at the research farm. So um, we of course don't expect that farmers would, you know, fertilize their rye if they're unless they're harvesting it for forage. So we understand that. Um, what we found was that seeding rate did not influence biomass at all. Um, so we did find that planting green increased biomass at both nitrogen rates, but it increased biomass more at the higher nitrogen rate. So um, with more time for that cereal rye to grow and take up the nitrogen that was applied around green up in the spring, we you know, hypothesized that that's what's allowing for this extra growth in the, the higher nitrogen situation. So um, for that reason, it, it can be risky to have 
to plant grain in a very, very high fertility situation. Um, we found that seeding rate and nitrogen rate had no impact on soil moisture. So again, uh, so this is that soil moisture. You can see the same trend as I showed previously. Um, seeding rate and end rate didn't impact that at all. So for that reason, if we're getting the same biomass with a low seeding rate and we're getting the same impact on soil moisture, um, we you know, conclude that why not cut back on that seeding rate? So we know that planting green cool soil, we did find that there was a significant impact of seeding rate on soil temperature. So um, that's displayed here, the lowest seeding rate, which was 34 kilos per hectare or 30 pounds per acre, that was significantly warmer than the higher seeding rates across termination timing. So there's another reason why cutting back on that seeding rate could can be a benefit. So you're getting the soil moisture management benefits, you're getting the biomass, but the soil's warmer. And since soil cooling is one of the challenges we have with planting green, this seems like you know, a best practice than we, we can confidently say now. Um, and then again, uh, so, so David presented the, the yield data and, and they found that the lower seeding rate had the highest yield. And, and we found uh, the same uh, with, with planting green. It was better to reduce seeding rate and um, reduce nitrogen rate. So that's where we had the highest yield with planting green. And um, so just another reason why we would say uh, reduce the seeding rate. We did do a partial budget analysis and I won't get into it, um, except to say that, you know, the, the trends that I've been laying out follow through uh, to the partial budget. So if you can save some money on seed and nitrogen, of course, if you're not buying in organic nitrogen, it doesn't, the numbers don't pencil out quite the same, but you can save some input costs on reducing your seeding rate and your yield is higher if you're reducing your seeding rate. So of course you come out on top um, uh, with, with your budget. So um, I know I only have a couple minutes left. I'm gonna try to go really quickly through this. We found rolling and using row cleaners um, to be a best practice. This picture is from a colleague of mine who had a farmer who planted corn green and did not roll that cover crop. You can see the corn is very tall and spindly. You can see there was uneven emergence with um, you know, delayed emergence uh, by several days for some plants, which this plant now becomes a weed to this corn plant and can reduce yield. You can see uh, some heavy slug feeding on these plants where there was no rolling. Um, we did do a study comparing uh, rolling versus no rolling and then engaging row cleaners versus not. And the summary of this study is that um, Un, we, we found that unrolled corn was taller, um, or corn was taller in the unrolled treatment, treatment with more variation uh, due to uneven emergence, and that was as we expected. We also had a higher slug feeding at some sites where, where the corn or the cereal rye was unrolled. Um, and yield was not impacted by rolling or not, but early burn down did yield higher at a number of sites. So, um, you know, what we summarize from this is that, you know, in some instances, it is better to do an early burn down. There, there may be a yield penalty to planting green. If you're committed to planting green, we highly recommend rolling that cover crop and then um, using row cleaners if you have them uh, until you're very comfortable with the practice. And, um, and then it, it's up to the, the grower to decide if they want to use row cleaners or not. There weren't huge differences between rolling with or without row cleaners. Um, here's a picture of what type of mess you can get with um, you know, drill seeding into a big cover crop. And this is an instance where I think the picture maybe speaks louder than words. Um, we know from other studies, um, 
studies outside of planting green just in no-till situations that uh, planters have better precision, better singulation, um, and you can, you can get better stands with, with a planter instead of a drill. But again, this is one that is kind of up to the grower and the equipment you have available to you. Um, understanding carbon to nitrogen ratio. So as we plant green, that cover crop is becoming more mature and higher in carbon, and it does have the potential to tie up nitrogen for longer into the year. So uh, the fellows before me did show that the uh, nitrogen that was tied up in the cover crop did increase when we plant green, and we found the same thing. The, the nitrogen that is available increases when you plant green, but we know your carbon to nitrogen ratio also increases as you delay termination timing. So even though there's more nitrogen tied up, it does take longer to be released. Uh, so we, we would recommend putting on more nitrogen up front to, to get that corn crop um, through uh, to when the nitrogen does start to be released from that cover crop. Um, and we did also see some nitrogen tie up even in crimson clover when we planted green. Um, so even though it's a legume, even though it was providing lots of nitrogen for us, the carbon to nitrogen ratio um, was uh, such that we, we saw some nitrogen tie up. Um, I'll end with scouting and using IPM. We had some surprise insects show up. Uh, uh, stink bugs. Um, showed up when we planted green with crimson clover specifically two years in a row. Uh, it didn't show up in the cereal rye and it didn't show up in crimson clover killed early. So it's something to be aware of. And of course, slugs are, are a perennial problem for no-till cover croppers that you just have to manage um, and apply rescue treatments as is uh, economically viable. And lastly, uh, finding a planting green mentor. So <clears throat> this isn't one size fits all. It can be done with tons of different types of equipment. You can use a big drum roller. You can use uh, the Dawn residue managers, the mini crimpers on every row unit. Every farmer I've talked to has a different opinion about uh, closing wheels and coulters and row cleaners. Um, talk to someone that has done it successfully and play around with it and see what works for your farm and your soils. And so I will end it there, Erin. Uh, sorry, I went a couple minutes over, but I can take questions now. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, so do we have, uh, it is uh, the very end. So um, are there any questions from the audience? We had one on online. Okay, go ahead, David. Yeah. What's up, rolling it after planting? Have you tried rolling after planting? I, yeah, I get this question every time I give this talk. So I personally have not. I have talked to farmers who have done it successfully with soybeans and like to do it. Um, and they have, let's see, plant soybeans and then roll and kill like three weeks to a month later, in quite a while. And there's uh, a CCA or an agronomist out of uh, Maryland or Delaware who was doing some similar work and had great success with soybeans. Um, I can't personally vouch for that practice. Um, it makes me really nervous, but if you wanna try it on a couple acres with beans, it is potentially viable. With corn, um, I, I think if you could time it for, um, you know when that growing point is still below the ground, it could be okay. But corn is so very sensitive to competition from from weeds and um, so prone to getting spindly and skinny. I I really hesitate to do with corn, but I encourage you to try. Okay, and then the only uh, other question that we had uh, was from the chat. And uh, basically, it was asking, how about planting green with the drag hose manure application? Will the cover crop stand back up after the hose knocks it over? What about the tractor wheel tracks? Um, so, Heidi, do you have anything for that? I had one comment, but go ahead. So, this would be um, 
a, a crop cover crop has been planted and then the injection is occurring in the spring and then you would wait a couple more weeks to do corn planting, something like that. Am I understanding that right? Uh, well, I only have the information from the chat. Which I okay. <laughs> Maybe I can talk to Matt offline. Um, there's, there's but... a... oh, go ahead. My, my comment on it, I see guys that drag holes into a living cover crop. It stands right off very few days afterwards. It's not, it will, if anything, will start taking off because of the nitrogen credits coming from the manure. So that's not an issue. It was damn right back off pretty quickly after the drag line application with the remotes and all that kind of issue. Uh, and I will say that uh, on another farm, uh, we didn't have the roller curper available in time. Um, and so they used their tractor to, to knock it down um, and drive around on the plots. And also it came back up and it, it was a disaster. It was actually a failure of a crop. So I would not recommend trying to do that uh, based on that one field. 